Islamophobia. But what exactly is Islamophobia? Well, this week, a cross-party group of MPs have released a report after months of speaking to people across the country to try and define it in a bit to tackle the problem head-on. In doing so, they say they have discovered the scale of Islamophobic attacks in the UK. So, just how big is the problem? According to British politicians this week, the UK has a huge problem with Islamophobia. I disagree. On the contrary, this country has a problem with Islamophilia, the fetishization of Islam and Muslims by the political establishment, entertainment industries, charities and all sectors of public society. Western civilization as a whole is suffering from this mental affliction, but my country is one of the worst perpetrators of it. The very idea that the large presence of Islam and practicing Muslims in Britain can produce serious problems is instantly shot down by the powers that be, denied, ridiculed, and the people making the complaints are then attacked in the media, slandered and discredited on a personal level. This has been the way for decades. But despite this, the opposition from the British population remains, and in many areas is growing. The cat is out of the bag regarding Islam in the UK and the people aren't happy. So what does the British government do to try and keep a lid on the situation? To try and stamp out this sentiment? That's right, they write and release a report and suggest a law be created that officially defines all kinds of Islamophobia as cold-blooded racism. How predictable. Today we'll be looking at this report, the people who are behind it, and the consequences of such a law being implemented. You know, most sane people in the West believe blasphemy laws should be confined to the Dark Ages, but in the name of progressivism, our illustrious leaders think it deserves a comeback. I woke up this morning to this headline in The Independent. Islamophobia is a form of racism. Like anti-Semitism, it's time it got its own definition. It has become so normalized in our society, yet we struggle to define it. Our report will provide something we can all get behind. Already we're in trouble, aren't we? We'll get onto the accusation of racism in a second, but the subheading is very telling. Maybe Islamophobia is hard to define because it's a completely made up word designed specifically to serve a political agenda. The definitions of Islamophobia change depending on the situation. Islamophobia, according to those who define it, can encompass everything. From a criticism of Muhammad, to a snide remark about a hijab, to physical assault in the street. No wonder the government has been pulling its hair out over this. How do they enforce their ridiculous hate crime laws if they can't even work out what people have actually done wrong? Easy solution, just say Islamophobia is racism. Done and dusted, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. However, this presents more problems, doesn't it? How can a religion be a race? After all, you can get brown Muslims, black Muslims, and yes, white Muslims. Islam is an ideology, a set of ideas, both political and social. We all know this, but I'm afraid to report to you that this doesn't matter anymore. The truth is, the line between Islam as an entity and Muslims as people has been intentionally blurred. Muslims have been treated by the media, by politicians, and by Muslims themselves as a type of race for a long, long time. Islamophobia is rooted in racism and is a type of racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. Are you all happy with that definition? Do you think it's accurate? Yeah. I think what's really important is that, firstly, any definition of, of racism in different ways needs to be owned by communities. Communities need to be, you know, this is something that 
we as Muslim communities need to need to have as part of us, as part of our, our daily lives in terms of how we interact and, and use it. But I think that more important than this, more important than the personal views of direct individuals, it's also about institutional and, and the government taking this on board, adopting the, the, the reality that Islamophobia is a type of racism and dealing with it as a result. And I think that there, there has been a long um, lack of action, in my opinion, within certain sections of government in terms of acting on the real rise of Islamophobia that's happened. And the fact that we've had a 40% rise in the last year uh, of hate crime against Muslims. We want there to be action taken and hopefully this can be a spur for that action. Some people think it's merely anti-Muslim hatred. Uh, what this is, 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 is a recognition that it is far beyond that. There are issues to do with structural issues, structural racism, which is part of um, the idea that many others face. And I think that we need to also de-exceptionalize Muslims. Muslims aren't different from other people who are facing this form of racism. It is very, very similar in, in the manifestations of it, it compared to how other actual races are being treated. And I think that what, what, this, what this definition tries to do is very much align the experiences of Muslims, whether it comes to verbal abuse, physical abuse, hate in different ways, or discrimination or structural racism, with the experiences, the lived experiences of many others who face that racism. And I think that's why this um, definition is very important. Like it or not, the mental image of an average Muslim, both in the minds of a typical Brit and a big wig in the media or government, resembles something like this. And by and large, this is quite an accurate representation. Most Muslims in Britain are from the Middle East and most of them are brown. Unfortunately, you can shout about Islam being an ideology, not a race, until you're blue in the face. Your words will always fall on deaf ears, especially to those on the left. To demonstrate this briefly, let's look at a comment I found under the independent article on Facebook from a man named Simon Carr. He says, they have to pass a law because racists on social media keep using the line, Islam is not a race, to justify their racism. Yes, Simon, yes. A law needs to be made to circumvent the fact that Muslims aren't a race, and this is perfectly acceptable to you, of course. I award you the gold medal in mental gymnastics. Congratulations, mate, you've earned it. Islam was racialized a long time ago and we need to recognize the war we are in. This week, a report into so-called Islamophobia has been released. It was commissioned to create a working definition of Islamophobia and this is what those big brains in Westminster came up with. Islamophobia is rooted in racism and is a type of racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. So there you have it. The official definition of the undefinable Islamophobia to be used in the UK from now on. Once again, confirming that the powers that be see it as definite racism. Cut and dry. Aren't you glad you live in a country where the atomic bomb of accusations, racism, can be moulded to mean anything? Oh yes, it's as fluid as gender now, apparently. Nothing in the modern West has a clear meaning anymore. Everything is up for grabs. We even have the creation of a brand new word here. Muslimness. Amazing stuff. It's important to note that the report was co-authored by the loathsome Anna Sobri possibly the least conservative conservative politician out there, the supreme virtue signaller who said last year that if only white British people could learn more from Muslims, we'd live in a better country. How this could possibly be the case is something she didn't elaborate on, probably because the very concept of it is ridiculous. But she was just saying it to get pats on the back from brown people, wasn't she? It's not hard to tell. She's also one of the most vocal anti-Brexit campaigners in the nation and compared the current situation to 1930s Germany. I've heard analogies with the 1930s where you have a lack of leadership in a country and then you have people feeling disenfranchised that nobody properly represents them. Then the blame culture starts, you know, blaming immigrants. As in, the, in Nazi Germany, they blame the Jews. God knows what horrors could come out of these things if we don't get it right. We've got to get it right. Oh yes, she's one of your typical immigrant-loving, white guilt-ridden, globalist fear-mongers who has to compare everything to the Nazis. 
You know the meme, everything I don't like is Hitler. That's Anna Sobri for you. So forgive me if I'm not jumping out of my seat with enthusiasm at the sight of her Islamophobia report. The purpose of this report is simple. Anyone with a brain between their ears can figure it out. This is just another step being taken to hush the British public. This will expand the hate crime sector, empower authorities to crack down even more on people sharing opinions on social media, and is, at its heart, yet another attack on free speech and more protectionism for a minority group that gains significant power in society by constantly playing the victim. Actual racism. Genuine criticism of Islam and Muslims will be discouraged. Verbalising the cultural problems people see with their own two eyes will become criminalised. And an atmosphere of fear and suppression will engulf the population, scaring them into silence. At least, that's what they hope will happen. Even though in the Independent article, which is also co-authored by Sobri, she says that this report isn't about protecting a religion from criticism. The actual report directly contradicts this statement. There's a section where the report lists certain things that would be considered Islamophobic, and now, because of this report, racist. Let me read a bit to you. Contemporary examples of Islamophobia in public life, the media, schools, the workplace, and in encounters between religions and non-religions in the public sphere could, taking into account the overall context, include, but are not limited to, why couldn't they just shorten this to say, this is what we consider to be Islamophobic instead of all this nonsense? Anyway, this is what they think is Islamophobic. You ready? Using the symbols and images associated with classic Islamophobia, for example, Muhammad being a paedophile, claims of Muslims spreading Islam by the sword, or subjugating minority groups under their rule to characterise Muslims as being sex groomers, inherently violent, or incapable of living harmoniously in plural societies. Calling Muhammad a paedophile is Islamophobic, despite it being the truth. How many times do we need to go over this, eh? He married a six-year-old girl and had sex with her when she was nine. That's paedophilia. That's not up for interpretation. However, as we saw recently, the European Court of Human Rights declared that saying Mohammed was a paedophile is no longer covered by freedom of speech. Anna Sobri has clearly been taking notes. Now, stating a fact, a well-known truth, is racism. Actual racism. Claims of Muslims spreading Islam by the sword and subjugating minority groups under their rule, again, this is a historical fact. Islam was spread across the Middle East, North Africa, and Southern Europe through military conquests, through war, invasion, death. This is why the phrase, Islam is a religion of peace, is a complete lie and a laughable one at that. Muhammad kept and distributed slaves, and allowed his troops to have sex with them, or rather, rape them, as let's be honest, they couldn't say no, could they? Why do you think groups like ISIS exist, who literally try to emulate Muhammad with their sickening actions? Or the mass rape and trafficking of British girls throughout England? Is it such a stretch to say that these people may, at some level, be justifying their behaviour by linking it back to their religion and the examples set by their prophet? So this report does very much dissuade criticism of Islam as a religion and the behaviour of its founder. Don't believe Anna when she says it doesn't. The main selling point in this report is the claim that hate crimes have risen against Muslims in Britain, hence tougher stances on Islamophobia need to be taken to protect them. But I have to say, many of the examples of hate crimes used within the document don't exactly make my heart bleed. There's also absolutely no mention of possible reasons why the public may have negative feelings towards the Muslim demographic. Almost as if everyone in Britain woke up one morning, got out of bed and decided to irrationally despise Muslims for no reason. I'll get back to that in a second. First though, here are some horrendous hate crimes to make you feel bad. One Muslim female wrote of the verbal abuse she faced at a petrol station during the morning school run in Birmingham. There was a large queue at a petrol station and a lady in another car got out and accused me of blocking the queue. 
This then quickly led to her blaming this on my hijab, as I couldn't see where I was going, calling me a paki, etc, and a whole lot of verbal abuse. No action was taken by the police, as I was a white revert Muslim. I was told there was no grounds to report the incident. It couldn't be reported as a race incident, as I didn't belong to any ethnicity other than English or white. No grounds to prosecute on religious hate crime, I could not take it any further. So basically, in a road rage incident, someone made fun of your hijab and called you a paki, even though you're a white Brit. Firstly, I'd say the person who called you that is probably a moron because you're clearly white, but the fact you're disappointed you couldn't report it as a race hate incident is hilarious. You aren't Pakistani. Wearing a hijab doesn't change your race. Although Anna Sobri probably heard about this case and was so horrified, she decided to turn all Muslims into an official race to get around this little hiccup. We heard of a mosque in Birmingham which allegedly had a pig's head and pig's blood sent to it. Someone emailed the mosque website suggesting that pig's heads and blood had been placed in a proposed site for a Muslim country. Shouldn't that say Muslim mosque? What? Anyway, we reported the incident to the police, but they couldn't find the perpetrator. The police advised that the land was checked and nothing found. We had no one else to turn to. Uh, right. So someone sent a prank email then. That's it. The police found nothing proving that nobody did anything. You're crying racism literally because someone said they'd leave a pig in a field. <laughs> How awful. How awful. How will you ever recover, eh? I dread to think. Actual racism. The report goes on and on with this sort of thing, listing individual accounts from people who felt that they were targeted for abuse because of their Muslimness. Mostly the incidents are rather benign, like an off-colour comment about a hijab, someone being asked whether they're related to Osama bin Laden. Admittedly, there are a few cases of actual assault in here, and I won't deny it, and I also won't condone any of it, but you know what? Anna Sobri can list all the victim anecdotes she wants, but none of them, and I repeat, none of them, come anywhere close to the horrendous atrocities committed in this country because of our growing Islamic population. I'm talking about the dozens of people who have been ruthlessly murdered by terrorist attacks. Westminster, Manchester, London Bridge, and the many more who have been spared due to failed attacks. Like the Parsons Green Tube Bomb, which surely would have killed several people if it had detonated properly. People seemed to forget about that one rather quickly, didn't they? I didn't. Also, let's not forget that if it weren't for our security services, hundreds more would have been slaughtered on our streets, as 12 Islamic attacks since March 2017 have been thwarted. Overall, since 2013, 25 attacks have been foiled. This is an astonishing amount considering the relatively small population of Muslims in the country compared to the natives, isn't it? I could go on. I could talk about the thousands of British girls who have been raped, trafficked, some even murdered, by predominantly Pakistani gangs. The local councils, usually overwhelmingly staffed with Muslims by the way, like in Rotherham, turned a blind eye to the abuse. And the local police didn't intervene because they were too scared of being called a racist. A new scandal is uncovered every week, it seems, these days. Can we not show our objection to this? How about the thousands of recorded cases of female genital mutilation in Britain? While not an exclusively Islamic practice, it is certainly very prominent throughout the Islamic world and is continuously growing within the West. It also took me two seconds to find an Islamic website on Google's first page that preaches about the benefits of FGM using passages from the Quran to do so. Another point of shame is the prominence of Sharia courts. Parallel legal systems that ignore the law of the land, that the government is also doing nothing about. If the left want equality and progressivism, they should be marching in the streets against this, as these courts, to put it lightly, don't exactly share the same opinions. What about the scourge of halal meat? 
a rapidly growing industry, exempt from British law in regards to humane animal slaughter, much like kosher, and is now being fed to our children in primary schools without their or their parents' knowledge. Am I Islamophobic or racist if I'm against this? Please let me know, Anna. Does any of this possibly go some way in explaining why British people are angry? Why tensions are bubbling over? The Muslim population, as recorded in the 2011 census, stands at 4.4%. It'll be more now, of course, but that's the last census that provided this data. 4.4%. And yet, we have all of these problems. Don't you think that's a cause for concern? What happens when this 4% reaches 8% or 15%? Do you think these problems will get better or worse? Will criminalising Islamophobia make these problems go away? I think we all know the answer to that. The longer the establishment continues to willfully ignore the societal catastrophe in store for us on the horizon, and instead tries to fight the reaction, not the cause, the more trouble we'll face, and yes, then you will see serious retaliation attacks towards Muslims. You certainly will. And the blood will be on the government's hands, on the hands of all the activists, the charities, the NGOs promoting open borders and multiculturalism, the figureheads demonising normal people for wanting to protect their daughters. The people behind the scenes profiting off our chaos, convincing our politicians that flooding our nation with the third world is a damn good idea. Well, I'm sure it pays very, very well. Reject this nonsense report. Reject the idea that you can't be angry about the promotion of Islam in our society and support people who want to fight against it. The parties of Westminster have sold you down the river. If you must engage in our sham of a democracy at all, there are places for you to go. And they aren't the Labour or Conservative parties. Thanks for watching. Actual races. Cheers for watching once again, everybody. I'd like to apologise for the lack of videos over the last two weeks. I've had family staying with me and my flat is tiny. So it's been quite hard for me to get away from the crowd and stop hosting and showing people around to record a video and edit something. It's been, it's just been impossible, really. So I'm sorry about that. But thank you for your patience. If you'd like to support this channel, you can do so in a few ways. The first is via PayPal. The link is down below. Thank you to everyone who donates so generously. Or you can become a monthly patron of mine. $5 or more will get your name at the end of every single one of my videos as a credit like these gorgeous people right here. I hope to get more videos out to you in the run-up to Christmas. Stick around, enjoy yourselves, and I'll see you next time.